Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck and Jerry's here. We're all feeling bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and chipper. Why aren't you? <laughs> Not me. I'm sleepy. Are you really sleepy? Yeah. How do you sleep? Uh, like a side sleeper or just... No, how's uh, your sleep? <laughs> generally? Yeah. Uh, my sleep is pretty good. Um, I get up a lot to go potty. Me too. Sucks. Um, but um, I've gotten way better probably since I've had a kid uh, of being able to fall back asleep pretty easily, mm -hmm. uh, whereas I used to not be so good at that. And that's a real key to getting good sleep is because um, very few people, I think adults are, I mean, some are, but are just so sound that they're just rocks through the night. Right. You got to be able to get back to sleep. Um, if you start thinking about stuff, then you're toast. Yeah. If some people have trouble falling back asleep. Mm -hmm. Some people, Chuck, get this, have trouble falling asleep initially even. I have a lot of empathy for Me people too. with chronic insomnia, which we're talking about insomnia. It just sounds like a terrible thing. Uh, we talked about fatal familial insomnia. Yeah. And we've talked about, like, how much sleep do people need? That was one of the, like, early, early ones. And is science phasing out sleep? That was about nootropics. Yeah, but I was really surprised that we hadn't just done a, a, a regular old insomnia app. That was, too. Uh, but big thanks to the uh, National Institute of Health Great. and Sleep Foundation. Yes. Uh, our old friends at HowStuffWorks.com. Okay. University of Pennsylvania, Harvard. Uh, I, I got a lot of different sources for this one. And... Uh, here we go with insomnia. <laughs> okay. I guess we're starting, everybody. <laughs> this is a preamble. So um, I thought that uh, this definition of insomnia was about as succinct as it can be. Mm -hmm. It's a sleep disorder characterized by difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or both. Mm -hmm. This is very important. Even if you have ample time to fall asleep or sleep, mm -hmm. even if you have a bedroom environment conducive to restful sleep. Right. So you Those got everything caveats. you need to sleep and you still can't sleep. You still can't stay asleep or both. Yeah. Uh, if you – and we'll get to all the different kinds. It gets a little confusing, actually. I'm still not 100% sure <laughs> how to classify the different types of insomnia. Uh, I think they rolled it all together. Well, yeah, true. Uh, but if you, you know, if you live next door to, uh, or above an apartment above like a loud club or if you oh my. recently had like a, a big shift in your work hours, mm -hmm. like – these are all reasons that you might not be able to get to sleep and you may have insomnia, but, and again, we'll go over all these in more detail, but that is like a temporary or transient insomnia. Um, transient, if it's, if it's really just a few days, like if you have jet lag or something, and then if it's a few days into like a week or two, then it can, uh, then it travels to, uh, what's the other kind? Chronic. <laughs> no, no, no. Acute. Pre uh, acute insomnia. And then chronic is the, the really, really tough one. Right. We'll, we'll break all that out, but we should talk a little more about what happens with insomnia and like what, what's required to actually get a diagnosis. Because it's not enough to, to show up and say like, I'm, I'm having trouble sleeping. The, you have to say, I'm having trouble sleeping and I can't finish the sentence during the day because I'm so tired. Yeah. And you also, uh, the first thing your doctor is going to say is like, how much sleep are you getting? Because as we went over in our do you really you need say to sleep none <laughs> do you really need to sleep episode and it's a big swath it's interesting when you look at the breakdown of how much sleep you need as you age mm -hmm. uh i can't remember what it was for preteen it's like a million hours a day it was a lot but uh, 13 to 18 is 8 to 10 hours and then they say between 18 once you hit 18 all the way up into 64 years of age mm -hmm. uh you need about um six to eight hours. No, no, I'm sorry, seven to nine hours. Right. And then once you get a little bit older than 65, that actually goes down to seven to eight instead of seven to nine. You know what sucks, though, is I saw not necessarily that you need less sleep as you age, but that you get less sleep as you age, whether you want to or not, because your sleep deteriorates, um, your ability to sleep deteriorates because your yeah, brain's shot really over time. <laughs> Yeah, and you and I know that you can testify to this, but as you get older, the ability for most people to sleep in is really what goes. I'm glad for that. I've actually started getting up earlier and earlier, and I I like no it. kidding. Yeah, why? <laughs> no, Have you I noticed mean, some of the timestamps on emails I've sent you. 
Yeah, it's not like I get alerts or anything. It's not like you're waking me up, but I'll, I'll see emails from you in uh, like the 604 range. I'm like, all right, Josh is at it, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've already had my coffee and gone for a jog by then. Uh, I get up early too, and I am glad for it because I, I like mornings, and I think a lot of good work is done in the morning. And so That's what Dolly Parton till, says. If I can sleep until 8 a.m., that's a oh, that's a coup. I would feel like I wasted the entire day if I slept till 8 I would feel well, like I uh, yeah, had, sure. must have raved all night if I, if I woke up at 8. But sometimes I'm the earliest riser in my house, like on weekends. Emily can still sleep. I mean, she has bouts of insomnia oh, no. for sure, but um, when she sleeps, she can, she can rock it, man. That's awesome. Yeah. That's 10, 10 o'clock or so if, I, if it happens. Pretty enviable. No kidding. Yeah, I haven't done that in a really long, long time. How does Yumi sleep? She sleeps fine. I mean, she's, but does she get up earlier? Does she sleep a little later? She um, gets up. She's awake earlier mm-hmm. than she gets up because Momo sleeps in later. So there's just like morning bed relaxation. Yeah, and Yumi doesn't want to disturb Mo because Mo will follow her out and like it'll it'll affect her last like hour of sleep. So yeah, she hangs out with Mo <laughs> and does Plus, like stuff on hey, her man, computer. Uh, that 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 weekend spend that first hour in bed doing stuff is very nice and relaxing. Totally. You mean like eating barbecue? (laughs) (laughs) All right. So insomnia in Latin literally means no sleep. And uh, they had to settle on a number. Um, You know, it it really varies on how long it takes people to fall asleep, obviously. Mm -hmm. But they had to get together finally and say, we got to come up with a number, everybody, for what you should shoot for. And what they eventually landed on was 20 minutes to fall asleep is what they consider sort of the quote-unquote normal range. Mm-hmm. And if you're going well, well beyond that, then uh, you may have insomnia. Yes. Um, yeah, it, I, that's weird. Like, I think that you usually need 30 to 45 minutes to fall asleep. And I don't know if that's just on the nights where you get sleep or if that alone qualifies you for insomnia. Because yeah, because 30 doesn't, I mean, that's only 10 minutes more. No, but that would qualify as difficulty falling asleep, which the term yeah. for that is sleep onset insomnia. And that's if you're really trying to go to sleep. You're not laying there scrolling through your <clears throat> social meds. Right. And we'll see that um, <clears throat> trying to go to sleep can have a, like a counterproductive effect on people with insomnia because there's a type of insomnia where you are worried you're not going to get sleep so much that you can't fall asleep. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest, I think, things about insomnia. If you if you really have bad insomnia, is the worry, and even the in the hours before bedtime, people will start to worry, and that's just such a sad way to live, you know. Yeah, the idea of thinking about your bedroom as a place of dread and anxiety know, is really, really sad to me. And I, I, I love my bedroom. Yes, me too. And I, I hope that everyone with insomnia uh, gets over it eventually, because everyone deserves good sleep. Yeah, and you know, uh, <clears throat> it goes without saying that lack of sleep can cause all sorts of medical health issues because your body needs sleep. Um, not to mention accidents that can happen when you're too sleepy, yeah. whether it's falling asleep at the wheels or if you, you know, work a shift job and you're running machinery and stuff like that. Uh, all kinds of bad things have happened because you haven't had enough sleep. Yes. And so you say, OK, well, this is a disorder that affects a lot of people. Did you say how many people have it? I didn't. We didn't go over the stats. Why don't you hit them with some? OK, I'm taking the stat man role for today. All right. I'm going to take a quick little micro sleep. As many as 70 million Americans have some sort of sleep disorder, which would include insomnia, and that at any given night, there's 10% of people in the United States are having trouble sleeping. That's a lot of people. That's 25 million, something like that. Yeah. And that eventually about two thirds of people will experience insomnia to some degree or another. Yeah. I also saw some worldwide statistics that said that, and this wasn't necessarily just insomnia, but 62% of people all around the world say they don't get enough sleep. Yeah. That's a lot. That's, you know, in the majority. Yeah, that's sad. People aren't sleeping enough. And it's supposedly a pretty modern um, problem because I saw some uh, some sleep doctor, I think he was a neurologist, and he was saying, like, you know, <laughs> we have ways of storing up energy uh, later on 
because mm-hmm. we, humans as a species have encountered, you know, feast or famine cycles before. So our bodies evolved to like store food for a while in times of, of leanness, right? Mm-hmm. We don't have that with um, sleep. Like we don't have a way to store um, like a, a wakefulness or something like that or energy in our brain for times when we don't get sleep. And he was saying that's evidence right there that that we've never as a species encountered difficulty sleeping before, that that is a very mm-hmm. new thing. That's really interesting. Yeah, I thought so too. And not surprising. Um, there is not a, like a single, you can't point to a single cause or all kinds of reason someone might have insomnia um but most of them boil down as as far as like not uh non-psychological causes there are many 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 phys- physiological arousals that might keep you awake and it's you know it's at bedtime it's not when you want them so like your body temperature might be up or your your heart rate might be up or your cortisol levels or other hormones might be Man, jumping around that's awful. and this is happening at bedtime which is not when you want that stuff to happen. Uh, you may have also gotten it from, uh, it could be genetic, uh, might have something to do with your age. Uh, I think women are more likely to have bouts of insomnia than men. Especially if they are pregnant. Oh, big time. It's like 80-something percent, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and if you, it can also be um, comorbid with a lot of different kinds of uh, mental health disorders, uh, especially things like depression and anxiety. Uh, I think it was something like 80, 85% of people with depression like also have insomnia. Man. So let's dig in a little more to these categories, these baffling, confusing categories, okay? <laughs> sure. You mentioned transient insomnia. That's, say, just a, a day or two or a couple of days. Say you have like a, a, a good example is an upcoming deadline at work. Right. Okay? Keeping you up. Totally makes sense. Mm-hmm. But once the deadline comes and goes, no matter what, you're probably going to be able to sleep again. Um, if you have a longer-term Say if you have a much bigger problem or a much more extended thing that's making you upset, uh, that would probably translate into that acute insomnia. Mm -hmm. And then anything over, I saw three months, I saw a month. But if you have trouble sleeping um, at least three days a week for longer than three months, Mm -hmm. you, my friend, have skated, unfortunately, into chronic insomnia. Yeah, and I think... Part of the diagnosis too is that it has to, um, it has to be affecting your daily your your wake time as well, right? right. Yes. So uh, you're not able to concentrate at work. Maybe your relationships are suffering. Like it's it's really kind of wrecking your daytime hours as well. Yeah, you turn into Edward Norton in Fight Club. <laughs> so here's my question, because I thought I had it sorted. Now I'm not not really sure because the DSM. And then the – what's the official sleep uh, uh, manual called? I can't remember. It's uh, not the DSM. The sleep Bible. Yeah, sure. Let's call it that. But they've they've kind of changed things over the years to just to confuse people. Uh, but there's also primary and secondary insomnia, right? Yes. And I don't believe this is the case anymore. I think they used to, they used to divide it up until very recently. Mm-hmm. But primary insomnia was where the insomnia itself is the disorder. There's not another cause. It's not comorbid with something. It's the problem itself. Um, And they they further broke it down into three subcategories of primary insomnia, psychophysiological, idiopathic, and paradoxical. Yeah, idiopathic literally means there's no cause, and that's the one that they've basically gotten rid of completely. Yes. Um, Although I did see... That there was still some debate going on. I'm sure there's still some people like that don't want to give that up for some reason. Yeah, they're like but they, they really basic- love the name. <laughs> uh, they basically said though that like that there is a reason behind. Uh, I think idiopathic was like you know, you're you're sort of a kid that can't sleep, and then you're an adult who can't sleep, and there just never is any reason. And they're basically saying like that's really not true. You're convinced throughout your life that there really is a monster in your closet. You just can't shake it. That's right. Uh, there's also that psychophysiological one I said where this is the one where you're worried about sleep. Mm-hmm. And supposedly all it takes is one one night where there's trouble sleeping for um, somebody with um, psychophysiological insomnia to start worrying that they're not going to get sleep. And then that worry leads them to not get sleep. It's like a self-fulfilling mm-hmm. prophecy. Uh, and that's its own subtype. And then there's that paradoxical one, right? Paradoxical. 
uh, is sort of confusing because it is a paradox, and I guess those are confusing. But that means you have um, you you experience sleeplessness, mm -hmm. but you don't have the bad effects during the day somehow. Yeah, that's just strange. Yeah. And then there's secondary insomnia, and that's where the insomnia is a – it comes – it arises from a, a disorder. It's secondary to the actual real issue where if you solve the first issue, the insomnia should reasonably be expected to go away. Yeah, and that's that's always been sort of the lion's share of cases, like 80 percent or more. And I think I read that they basically combined everything – because they were like, the treatment's not going to be that wildly different because mm -hmm. there are only certain things you can try. Mm -hmm. And we should try these for everyone that has insomnia. Plus, it's not a good look for psychology as a field that there is a, uh, a an entire category of we don't know insomnia. <laughs> yeah, true. So some of the things that can that can trigger secondary insomnia, you mentioned some people at risk like um, uh, pregnant people or mm -hmm. – um, the uh, the elderly as you age, but also yeah. um, the, the people with depression, uh, anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder. Um, apparently, eighty five percent of people who have clinical depression also have insomnia, and um, there's also a lot of drugs that can keep you up as well. Ironically, those same people who have depression, their treatment for depression SSRIs can actually keep them up. And give them insomnia as well. So they they would have double secondary insomnia. It sounds like. Yeah, there are all kinds of, um, and these are drugs that people, you know, are are very popular for a lot of things like um, cardiovascular disease and asthma and allergies mm -hmm. and beta blockers and alpha blockers, like all kinds of very common drugs. One of the side effects, oftentimes, is sleeplessness. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know. You always have to take that into consideration for the picture of your overall health. Right. Chuck, I think it's high time we took a break. Let's do it. Okay. Hey, I have another stat for you before we get started again. Let's hear it, stat man. So, um, stat man Crothers. I saw that Sorry. your sleep deteriorates with your age is what I was saying earlier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they apparently quantified it that you, you lose about 27 minutes per night each decade from middle age. Mm, middle age meaning in your 40s? That's what I'm guessing. It's, I think it was the beginning of middle age and... I got so to in tell your you, 50s, I feel middle aged. So in your fifties, about a half hour less. In your sixties, that would be about an hour less. Yep, seventies, hour and a half. Seventies, hour and a half. Eighties. Oh, let's boy. not even talk about it. No, man. And that's I'm, again that's depressing. That's not where you're like, oh, I don't need any sleep. I'm a senior citizen. It's it's like my sleep sucks now compared to how it was when I was younger. Yeah, yeah, that's no good. <clears throat> uh, I saw some other low risk categories, or I'm sorry, high risk categories. Mm -hmm that um, are not surprising, but maybe often overlooked. And one was low-income mm. uh, households and people um, oftentimes have insomnia because of that stuff, something you might not think about much. Yeah, worrying about things like bills or paying rent or yeah, absolutely. groceries and all that stuff, that's, that will keep you up at night, and that is that qualifies as insomnia. Uh, obviously, any anyone suffering chronic pain, uh, diabetes is another one, mm -hmm. uh, and then the, you know, sort of the... Um, sleep apnea and like restless leg syndrome and the Jimmy legs, stuff like that. I knew you were going to say it. If you <laughs> didn't say it, I was going to say it. Yeah, that's all going to keep you up uh, more. And again, something like restless leg syndrome might wake you up, mm -hmm. um, but it's that ability to get back to sleep is when it becomes a big problem. Yeah. So an inability to fall back asleep is sleep maintenance insomnia. Oh, okay. There's all these great terms associated yeah. with this stuff. They get really specific. Sleep is one of the more studied things. You bet your sweet bippy it is, Chuck. <laughs> uh, as far as the diagnosis, like you were talking about, you can't just stroll in and say, like, I can't sleep, and they say, here's some drugs to help you. Well, they or might. They, they, yeah, they actually might. So uh, forget I said that. <laughs> Scratch that. Uh, but it does start with you telling your doctor, uh, because they're not with you in the bedroom, so unless you're married to a doctor, um, 
so you do go in and say, I can't sleep. And what they're probably going to do is say, well, really describe that. Um, and they may give you something right away or they may say, well, why don't you keep a sleep diary for a week? Because someone might just say, like, I don't really know. I just know that like, I wake up a lot and stuff. And the, and the sleep diary is what makes the patient really kind of track what's going on to help both you and the doctor, like helping you help yourself. Yeah, and they're not just going to say, I don't know. They're going to be like, I don't know, okay? I haven't slept right. in two weeks, okay? Get off my back. <laughs> yeah, you see these bags under my eyes? So with the sleep diary, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, you know, how much um, how much did you drink that day? What did you eat that day? Did you exercise yeah. that day? What time? What time did you go to bed? Uh, how long did it take for you to get to sleep? Um, just Just little details like that that you take for granted when your sleep isn't problematic. Um, right. It, but that you can really kind of observe and, and come up with some real easy things that you can change in your life um, that that might help you go to sleep. There's something called sleep hygiene. Yeah. I mean, that's what you're describing basically is someone's sleep hygiene, whether it's good or bad. Right. So what is sleep hygiene, Chuck, which is better than hygienic utensil, but still not great? <laughs> well, it's exactly what you were saying, which is um, – do you exercise too close to your sleep? Uh, were you looking at a screen that emits blue light? That's a big one. Like right, but it's a huge one these days, of course. Um, like right before you go to sleep. Um, how you know? Did you eat? What What did you drink? Had you had any kind of stimulant? Uh, and even alcohol is really bad as well. Like drinking alcohol, even though this not something you might think of as a stimulant. Did you do it, a, a big hog's leg of cocaine right before you went to bed? <laughs> sure, the sleep hygiene is sort of all the things. That go into, um, um, you know, do you have good uh, good light blocking in your room, sound blocking, like all of the stuff that goes into a good night's sleep is sleep hygiene. Right. And so all those things you don't want to do, like actually you'd think exercising would be a good thing to do. No, it's actually, it really energizes you if you've ever paid attention after you mm -hmm. you exercise. Like, yes, your body is so sore and you're kind of slow, but you're, you, you feel good. You don't want to do that. You might actually want to take up yoga before you sleep. Um, yoga makes me sleepy. Yeah. It, it's like, especially if you do specifically uh, yoga designed for bedtime, which is basically just some like kind of light stretches, 10, 15 minutes. If you're having trouble sleeping and you don't try bedtime yoga, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. I do morning yoga and I find that I want to take a nap after. Yeah. It feels, I really it do. feels good though. I love yoga uh, it. It does. Uh, they also say, as far as um, your sleep hygiene, that you want to have a regular. I mean, if you're if you're doing it right, I know it's hard for people, but you try to have a regular bedtime and wake time, and that includes weekends. So, if you're having trouble sleeping and you're doing that thing where you're like, you know, you're you're staying up on the weekends and stuff like that, you're not doing yourselves any favors. No. Nope. Um, also, you want your bedroom to be conducive to sleep. Remember, that was one of the things. That mm -hmm. insomnia had to call. You had to have enough time and a place to sleep that was great. And yeah. they say your bedroom should be only used for sleeping and sex. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, and what only if you're one? only if you're a consenting <laughs> adult above age uh -huh. eighteen and you're in a loving relationship. <laughs> okay, Dad. So um, th that which makes a lot of sense because you come to train yourself. You you associate your bed with sleeping so that when you go to bed and you see your bed and you're in your bedroom, you mm -hmm. you fall asleep much more quickly because you've trained yourself to think of that's the place that I sleep that's not for doing taxes right. or snorting a lot of cocaine. It's it's where I sleep. Yeah. You know, our, our buddy, uh, John Hodgman, has long uh, established precedent that he feels very strongly that you should have the, if you're in a, a partnered relationship, mm -hmm. have the very largest bed that you can afford without it being like a financial burden. Right. Uh, and that will fit. Uh, even if it doesn't fit that good, he says you should get one. <laughs> it if, if you can, If you can afford it, like just squeeze it in there. Uh, and he says the ideal coupled sleep situation is to completely separate bedrooms separated by uh, a courtyard with a fountain in the middle of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's how you get the best sleep. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's... People, people weren't meant to sleep together. 
it's it's definitely a, a thing that I think people are finally like, okay, this might not be the best idea. Like, we might mm-hmm. need to find some other way around. People have come up with workarounds. Yeah. Apparently, more and more architects are um, being asked to create two primary bedrooms rather than just the one. Hey, man, if you can pull that off, I say go for it. It doesn't doesn't mean anything about your marriage nope. that, that you want to have good sleep. So no, it doesn't. Just get ready. You can even cuddle together and then say, and good night, and then get up and go to your separate places. Yeah. And in the morning, you can scurry on in there and jump into bed and cuddle in the morning if you want. Uh, I say this as someone who does this. We're not smart enough. We, we sleep together and keep each other up all night. Do you really? Not really. I mean, our animals will keep us up. Yeah, I feel bad for Emily. The cats literally lay on top of her body. Right. Two cats laying on top of her body. Yeah, Yumi does not... She has dog, dog in the foot space. It, it's problematic. Yeah. So Momo will will tap Yumi to roll over, and yeah, and spoon her, and and or she'll say like, um, "I want to get on the other side of you," and rather mm-hmm. than just climb over Yumi, she'll wake her up to let her know she's about to climb over. Her. Yeah. And Yumi's not the best at um, sleep maintenance, so it mm-hmm. takes her a while to get back to sleep. So yeah, and then other times I snore. Apparently, I'm told. <laughs> uh, so there'll be times where I'm just like, okay, you you need some sleep. I'm going to sleep out on the couch tonight. I've heard you snore before. Really? Guatemala, baby. So I do snore. I mean, hey, you snored in Guatemala. That's all I know. Yeah. I don't know if it was country specific. That's the only time we've bedded down together. I know everyone thinks we sleep in our own bunk rooms. <laughs> right. Uh, <clears throat> but getting back to Yumi and Momo, that's like proof that you can be a small dog and still disrupt sleep. Oh, yes. She's, it's not she's like size necessarily. And then also, don't forget, Yumi stays in bed to let Momo sleep in. That's how that's how kind and generous Yumi is to Mo. Man. And I'd how be, much oh, Mo takes advantage of Yumi. <laughs> I'd be elbowing that dog. Remember the spoon last night? You couldn't because she'd just look at you and like blink I a know. few times and you'd be like, do whatever you want. Doughy eyes. I love it. <laughs> Uh, we talked about TV. Yeah. You definitely shouldn't watch. I mean, everyone, that's generally when people watch TV, or at least you should, if you're sitting around watching TV all day, then that's, that's a problem in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But people, I think generally watch TV at night, uh, is in their evening viewing, but try and cut it, cut it off and give yourself a transition period before you actually try to fall asleep. Or, and this is, um, easy if you are on like a device or a laptop or something, there's. You can switch over from blue light to a, yeah. a warmer light, and it will Mine, have less yeah, of an sure. effect on you. If your TV can do that, bully for you. One of the other things that um, if you have trouble sleeping is getting get your TV out of your bedroom. Remember, like, the bed mm-hmm. is for sleeping. It's not for watching TV. Um, it is for me. I'm but, just saying, if you have yeah. trouble sleeping, this is yeah, this, yeah, a, that's a an easy fix for you. You watch TV. And then you go to bed. You don't go to bed and watch TV. If you have trouble sleeping, do what you want. I mean, but yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's just an easy solution if you're having trouble sleeping. Oh, no, for sure. If I had trouble sleeping, then I would get that TV out of there for sure. sure. Um, and I think sort of one of the takeaways there is 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 to make going to bed like a transition mm-hmm. from doing something to doing something else. However, as we'll see, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, like, Sometimes that transition can bring on the panic of like, oh, crap, like I have insomnia and now I'm going to the dreaded place. That's so sad. Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll talk about workarounds there. Um, should we take another break or should we wait? I think we should take a break. Okay, let's take a break and we'll take another little nap. And we'll be right back. So, are we at the place where we talk about uh, fixing it, Fix- and, and not and fixing it, and not uh, just in ways of improving sleep hygiene? Yeah, I think so. Because the other ways are basically a few. It's it's drugs, which we'll talk about, and then a couple of different therapies and like sleep retraining. Yeah, there's some. <laughs> They almost sound mean, but apparently they're really effective, some of the retraining. Yeah. Well, let's talk about it, Chuck. All right. Uh, well, obviously, relaxation techniques 
meditation, controlled breathing, mm -hmm. all these sort of low-level relaxing behavior therapies can really help you out if you can get in that kind of mind space. Yes. And then we talked about how just the idea of not being able to go to sleep can make you lose sleep and cause insomnia, just the fear mm -hmm. of that. So there's a technique called um, remaining passively awake where mm -hmm. you're like, I don't care if I go to sleep or not. I'm just staying up. It doesn't matter. And um, if I fall asleep, then great. If I don't, whatever. Uh, it's like you're changing your mindset so that you're not worried about it. You're just kind of taking a more casual approach to it. And apparently that can have the effect of um, removing the anxiety enough that you will fall asleep, kind of whether you mean to or not. Yeah. I just, man, I can think, I can't imagine what it's like to be so desperate that you're trying all these different things. Yeah. And imagine even trying these things will bring on anxiety. Uh, I have seen a thing where the bedroom can be such a, uh, like they recommend that you just, once you leave your bed in the morning, if you can, if you're in a, you know, studio apartment or something, then that that really stinks. But like close that bedroom door and do not go in there at all, all day yeah. long. Put a like, club like, on it. Act like it's not there. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Put a lock on the door. What, uh, what else? What about supplements? Well, one of the ones that people use a lot, Chuck, is melatonin. And mm -hmm. it's a natural supplement. They, As a matter of fact, they make it some of it from the pineal glands of animals. Did you know that? I did. I think most of it's synthesized, but I, I did know that some of it came from animal Yeah, and you, parts. you don't want those. You want the synthetic ones or maybe yeah. ones from microorganisms. But um, they say, like, yeah, you can take melatonin. If you have, like, maybe jet lag, you can take it for a night or two. Um, or if you if you have transient um, uh, uh, insomnia or your shift right. has just changed, you're doing shift work and it's just mm -hmm. changed. Um, melatonin can help. It does um, it's our brains produce it in response to darkness and it does help us sleep. The thing is, is over time, um, prolonged use, like if you have chronic insomnia, you do not want to use melatonin because it can have all sorts of de deleterious effects. <laughs> like um, because it controls not just how you sleep, but also your blood vessel tone, your body temperature, mm -hmm. your blood sugar. And you can mess with those things inadvertently over time by taking melatonin. Yeah, and that goes uh, that goes for parents. You know, they have the the kids sleep gummy, gummies. Yeah, and uh, we will use those very uh, like half of one very judiciously. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't want to. You know, the jury's kind of still out. But I don't know. For me, you don't want to be giving your kid like a sleep aid every single night. That was a lot of legal metaphors you just used. Well, I just you know I, I have seen like all kind like I don't think all the evidence is in on like kids taking melatonin. Yeah. Uh, but to me, that's reason enough to where, like, you wouldn't want to give your kid a, a melatonin gummy every night, even though, yeah. you know, you can be desperate as a parent when your kid won't go to sleep. I mean, they used to use and probably still use, like, Benadryl, right? Didn't that knock kids out? Uh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure some parents do use that. Really? All right. Yeah. Uh, and then cough syrup if you're really desperate, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, the uh, There are other, you know, supplements um there's not a ton of like scientific evidence uh, for stuff like aromatherapy to fall asleep and um, stuff like that and, and other supplements. But like, you know, if it's if it's safe to try, then you can give it a whirl uh, is what I think. Um, as far as that stuff goes, like try some aromatherapy. It might work for you. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to hurt. Probably not unless it like catches your curtains on fire. Like tryptophan is another one and valerian. Yeah, Valerian. Like these over, over the counter subs. I don't know if it was. I've never taken it as a pill. I've always made tea from Valerian root. Yeah. And same. it's an acquired taste for sure and an acquired smell. But it does have a very mellowing effect on me for sure. Yeah. And CBD, I, you know what? I meant to look into this because there are all kinds of uh, CBD gummies and things like that, like sleep gummies. So have you ever, have you taken CBD gummies and, 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 been able to sleep, like noticed any difference in your sleep or anything? Well, I don't need them for sleep, so I haven't tried it. Okay, but I know I know people who who do, and they report good things from it. Yeah, but you know who knows? We should do one on CBD because it's sort of the wild west. It is. Did you see Woody Harrelson's brother has his own line of it? Matthew McConaughey, <laughs> and he doesn't <laughs> say he's Woody Harrelson's brother, but his last name is Harrelson, 
And if he's uh-huh. not Woody Harrelson's brother, I will <laughs> eat a hat. I have a few of them. Uh, you saw that thing about he and McConaughey maybe being brothers for real. No. Yeah, that was recent. They they discovered, I can't remember, so I'm not going to try and uh, act like I remember the exact terms, but it was something about some, they found some possible family link. Wow. And there's a lot of similarities with them, and yeah. they're they're very, very, very close friends and a lot alike, and they, they were both kind of like, man, I wonder if this is true, so... I'm not sure if they're looking into it or not. So I, 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 I think her mom, while her, while McConaughey's mom was divorced mm-hmm. from his dad, and they eventually got remarried mm-hmm. at least once. Uh, I think that she knew Woody Harrelson's dad wow. and was like in the same town at the same time, <laughs> like nine months before one of them was conceived or something. Wow. I think it was something like that. Yeah. So we can't mention Woody Harrelson's dad and not remind everybody that he was a suspect in the JFK assassination yeah. at one point. <laughs> the very famous three tramps who yeah. were um, jacked up by the cops right afterward. One of them was Woody Harrelson's dad. That's right. And didn't Donald Trump say Ted Cruz's dad was in on it or something? I think <laughs> yeah, I think so. And then something, other, the internet like made Ted Cruz say that he's not the Zodiac killer. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Boy. He's like, I, I wasn't even so born weird. when he was <laughs> killing people. Or I was like five years old. Like, they made him say it. Oh, boy. So, um, you talked about prescriptions and, and you know, that may or yeah, may they're not. Yeah, like real drugs. Yes. Those can help, apparently, but they're they're meant for short periods of time because – you can very quickly develop a dependence on them. Yeah, most of them, like Ambien we've talked about, uh, and then uh, Lunesta, and these are, of course, the brand names of uh, Zolpidem and Etzopiclone, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, those, are, those are kind of known to be habit-forming and for short uh, periods, but I think I looked up that uh, Remelteon. I've not heard of which that is uh, that was in the in the stuff uh, that was in our article, but um, that I think is supposed to be non habit forming and has fewer side effects as something like Ambien. Remeltia? No, I didn't see that anywhere. Wow, that's yeah. interesting. Okay, yes, uh, okay, it's a the it's a, benzodiazepine uh, receptor antagonist, right? And but I think it's a melatonin receptor antagonist or agonist. It makes melatonin like crazy. It makes it ag. Um, they, uh, they also might prescribe antidepressants in low dosages, um, especially if you have anxiety over not sleeping, mm-hmm. which can help as well. But in particular with Ambien and Lunesta and those, um, sedative hypnotics, um, those are the ones where like they come with warnings saying like, be aware, like you may drive your car while you're sleeping. Yeah. You may right. like have sex or while you're sleeping <laughs> or do all sorts of risky behavior. Yeah. Eat a stick of butters like that, that perennial one, but it, it really does happen. What if someone read that and was like, eat a stick of butter? And they're like, yeah. So what's the problem? <laughs> right. I do that while I'm <laughs> wide awake. I used to catch uh, Ruby when she was younger, just uh, getting into the butter. Oh, yeah. Do you guys keep good yeah, butter like, around? I don't remember. Spoonful. Oh, of course. And she'll you see her with a big, like, piece of butter on a fork. I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, She's like, it's right. so good. It is good. But you keep like, the no, salted butter, is. right? <laughs> well, we have both. But, you know, I said you should, probably shouldn't do that. But it's like, you know, you're also five years old and, and a pat of butter's not going to kill you right now. Sure. <laughs> just like, just watch out. That's how they hook you. Yeah, exactly. Big butter. Should we talk about this world record stuff? I think so. So there have been a lot of people over the years. Uh, it used to be a thing where people would test the limits of, of human uh, uh, sleeplessness mm-hmm. and enter contests or vie for the world record and stuff like that. And through the decades, there have been many, many records uh, broken uh, until they basically, uh, the Guinness uh, company stopped in 1997 and said, we're going to stop monitoring this because... It's, like, straight-up dangerous. Yeah. But by the time they stopped, someone had gotten to 18 days, 21 hours, and 40 minutes. 453 hours. A guy named Robert McDonald from, um, I think, Modesto, California in 1986. A, yeah, he was a 27-year-old stunt man. Yeah. And that's 453 and change hours. Yeah. Uh, and this was a rocking chair marathon, which was uh, another one of the— Ladies from the UK, Maureen Weston, who 
was a record holder at one point. She was also in a rocking chair marathon. The guy who gets the most um, press, though, for having stayed up the longest, actually came in like fourth or fifth by now. Mm -hmm. Um, But his name is Randy Gardner. And back in 1963, he was a 17-year-old who was looking to win a science experiment contest. Right. So he decided to stay up as long as he could and break the record, which I think um, the the his record that he set was 11 days and 25 minutes, which was longer than the record at the time. Um, and at, at that time, I think in the 1960s, th- it was like a thing that DJs did. They would just stay yeah, up yeah. for ha- as long as they could. And if I'm not mistaken, before Randy Gardner, like the limit was around eight or nine days. So he really shattered the record. But other people had taken stimulants and really lost their their poop. Mm -hmm. Um, As a result, they basically took stimulants for eight days in a row and didn't sleep. Of course, it's going to mess with you. So he learned not to do that. But instead, he was distracted. He had two friends that stayed with him and eventually a doctor named Dr. William Dement, who um, would take uh, Randy Gardner to go play like pinball to keep Mm -hmm. him awake sometimes. Yeah, and I think that one is one of the most well-known because because of that doctor and the fact that he hung out and sort of quote unquote studied him. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, he experienced what you would think, which is hallucinations, delusions, uh, memory problems, perception issues, motor control issues. PCP. Yeah. All the stuff that you would expect when you can't get sleep. Yep. Um, But he also said that he believes that it had lasting damage. Um, He got, he developed uh, Alzheimer's in his sixties. He attributes it to that. He also developed insomnia later on in life, too. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He um, he oh, couldn't wow. sleep six hours a night. Jeez. All right. So maybe we should finish on uh, the long-promised um, cognitive behavioral therapy routine, uh-huh. uh, a.k.a. sleep boot camp. And then uh, what was the other one called? SCT? Uh, stimulus therapy. Stimulus S- control stimulus- therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because those used in conjunction seem to be sort of the gold standard. Yeah, right? there was an Australian um, study that that found out that if you put those two together over the course of five weeks, say goodbye insomnia. Right. Uh, so there are different ways to do you know all kinds of cognitive behavioral therapy, but uh, one common sleep boot camp would be um, something where you go into this program. You're supposed to, I believe, the night before. Uh, you're supposed to sleep no more than five hours. Mm -hmm. So you go in sort of sleepy. Mm -hmm. And then when you go in, uh, you go to a sleep lab uh, around bedtime, and then you spend the next 25 hours um, basically in little 30-minute, 50 different 30-minute sessions Mm -hmm. trying to fall asleep. You spend the next 25 hours in hell, essentially. (laughs) It sounds pretty bad. Yeah. Because uh, the goal here is they want you to know that you can fall asleep quicker than you usually do and what that feels like. And they do that by, like, saying, all right, try and fall asleep. And you try and fall asleep. And if they do fall asleep, after three minutes, they wake you up <laughs> and say, hey, w- do you think were you asleep just now? And if you say no, then they say, well, guess what? You were. Or you say yes, they'll say, congratulations, you were. And then they just keep doing that over and over so you're getting really, really more and more tired. So that sleep deprivation builds up until you kind of train yourself to fall asleep. Yeah. And then just to really mess with you, every time you do fall asleep, they change their clothes real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so you're really disoriented when you wake up. Put on a wig. Yeah. But so apparently in 25 hours, this this works. Like that boot camp will, will help cure you. And like you said, it, it shows people, yes, you can fall asleep. And that the sleep deprivation that's generated doesn't hurt either. Right. So that's that. Then the SCT, um, stimulus control therapy, is when they say, go go to your, this is not at a sleep uh, place or whatever, it's just in your regular uh-huh. house. Go to bed, and then after 20 minutes, if you're not asleep, get up and get out of that room and go to another room of your house and, like, read or meditate or do something that you know will relax you, something that is proven to relax mm-hmm. you. And then go back and try again. And if that doesn't work in 20 minutes, get up and leave the room again. But don't lay there in bed, essentially, for an hour or two, tossing and turning and stressing. Yeah, at the very least, you're distracting yourself from worrying, laying in bed worrying by going and doing something relaxing like reading a book. I also saw Listen to a Podcast. That's a good one. 
And then you just repeat as necessary until you fall asleep. And apparently five weeks of stimulus control therapy following a sleep boot camp program of Mm -hmm. 25 hours, um, this Australian um, study found that that is a really great way to get past chronic insomnia without any drugs. Yeah. And like, that's the good good news is I, I roundly found everywhere I looked that most people can cure their insomnia. Right. Um, that that is the good news, and a lot of the people who, uh, a lot of people never try. I think I saw, or I just did the math. It was something like sixty something percent of people. No, no, it was like eighty something percent say that they should get more sleep, mm-hmm. or they don't sleep well. Mm-hmm. I think was the stat, but only like sixty percent do something about it. So or maybe it was even less. It ended up being like 20 or 30% of people like have insomnia and and don't seek help. Yeah, I think a lot of them are like, well, wait a minute. Uh, to cure my insomnia, I need to stop looking at my phone right before bed? Then forget it. I'll just deal with the insomnia. Yeah, or just, you know, struggle through it. People, and I think the same goes with any uh, mental health issue. Like so many people just don't seek help. And, yeah try and figure it out for themselves and that it's oftentimes the very first step to solving your problem. Um, There's one other thing too, Chuck, that I want to talk about before we sign off here. Let's do it. Counting sheep. Apparently. Actually, I didn't get to read that. So teach me. Listen up. It not only doesn't work, it can actually keep you up longer. Mm -hmm. I could see that. They they think that it originated with um, medieval shepherds who devised a counting system to keep track of their flock. Mm -hmm. And the, the, upshot of it is that it's so boring that it would put anybody to sleep, even somebody who had trouble sleeping. But that's not actually the case. Um, And instead, researchers suggest, uh, if you're at the point where you're trying to count sheep, instead envision a really relaxing place, like a beach or Mm -hmm. a mountain cabin or whatever. Crowded shopping mall? Whatever relaxes you. Yeah, exactly. On on Black Friday. Um, And that concentrating on that um, and it being kind of engrossing is what will help you drift off to sleep. Or at the very least, it will distract you from worrying about um, not sleeping enough that you might fall asleep. You know, that sheep counting thing, we may have talked about that. That sounds familiar. Yeah. It's a, it's a long-standing trope. Yeah. Uh, well, since Chuck said, yeah, everybody, that means it's time for a listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this longtime listener. Uh, hey, guys and Jerry. Uh, I don't know what counts as a long-time listener, but I have been listening for over half my life. That counts. I think that counts. Uh, Nova. This is from Nova. Mm-hmm. That counts, Nova. I mm-hmm. uh, can't even remember when I first started listening. I remember, uh, I first remember listening when I was 10 or 11, maybe, and I used to listen to uh, back-to-back episodes in spare free time while playing Minecraft. I just graduated college with a degree in mechanical engineering. And I'm off to work at an awesome job where I get to work with planes. Uh, I just want to give you guys a big thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you do. I consider you guys role models in my life, and I strive to have your genuine curiosity and open-mindedness every day. Uh, Your podcast got me through some tough times, and I always knew that I could turn on some stuff you should know and feel better. Thanks for all the young minds that you have sharpened, and thank you from a big nerd for giving me so many fun facts, a curious nature, and a huge love of learning. I would never have even uh, considered or finished an engineering degree without the tools that you gave me. And I hope to inspire other engineers the way you inspired me. And I hope to be an even longer term listener. And that's from Nova. Nova, that stuff makes us feel great. Yeah, that was a great email. Full stop. <laughs> exactly. No no pithy comments. Nope, none whatsoever. <laughs> Thanks for letting us know, Nova. That's really cool. Um, and if you want to be like Nova and let us know how we impacted your life, hopefully in a positive way, uh, we love hearing that stuff. You can send us an email at stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.